The war on drugs, according to uslegal.com, is defined as a campaign adopted by the U.S. government along with the foreign military aid and with the assistance of participating countries to both define and to end the import, manufacture, sell, and the use of illegal drugs. During the U.S. Civil War, many soldiers were given opium to treat their illnesses, and it soon became a very popular drug among Americans, followed by cocaine, morphine, and heroin. Many store catalogs began to advertise these products that contained these drugs, meant for medical and recreational purposes. Because the harm and long-lasting effects of the drugs were so unknown, the amount of the drugs in the products were unregulated and often contained high amounts. Some of the first attempts made to regulate drug use were in 1875 in San Francisco, where the city enacted the first legislation against the smoking of opium. On February 9, 1909, Congress passed the Smoking Opium Exclusion Act, which prohibited the import, possession, and use of opium for smoking purposes, only allowing it for medical purposes. Both the legislation and the Opium Exclusion Act were deemed to be an anti-immigrant sentiment because the influx of Chinese immigrants, referred to as Chinese men, were stereotyped with smoking the drug, and many ads depicted them using it to lure innocent women and taking advantage of them. On December 17, 1914, the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act was passed, which regulated and taxed the production, importation, and distribution of opioids and coca products. The government soon began issuing racist propaganda against Chinese immigrants and black men, claiming that white women who used the drugs ran off with men of either race, and many articles played up a high number of crime rates committed by cocaine using black men. By 1937, marijuana was made illegal in 46 of 48 states to combat the so-called Mexican menace. It has often been said that the word marijuana is a racist term created to replace cannabis to make it sound more Mexican. The demand for drugs then skyrocketed in the 1960s as the use counterculture popularized the use of hallucinogens like LSD and marijuana. In 1971, President Richard Nixon officially declared the war on drugs, stating, America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I have asked the Congress to provide the legislative authority and the funds to fuel this kind of an offensive. This will be a worldwide offensive dealing with the problems of sources of supply as well as Americans who may be stationed abroad wherever they are in the world. It will be government-wide pulling together the nine different fragmented areas where, within the government in which this problem is now being handled. And it will be nationwide in terms of a new educational program uh, that we trust will result as uh, from the discussions that we have had. Nixon announced the creation of the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention, which coordinated various anti-drug programs of the federal government. In 1973, Nixon created the Drug Enforcement Agency, which combated drug smuggling and distribution. But from this time in 1977, however, 11 states decriminalized marijuana possession. To add on, your boy, President Jimmy the Peanut Farmer Carter, was inaugurated in January of 1977 on a campaign platform advocating for the decriminalization of marijuana. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan expanded Nixon's efforts and would increase anti-drug spending and the number of federal tax forces from going an average of $437 million during Carter's presidency to $1.4 billion during Reagan's first term. In 1984, First Lady Nancy Reagan began her no. campaign, which was a funded effort that educated students on the dangers of drugs. In 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act was created, establishing a series of mandatory minimal, minimum prison sentences for possession of drugs. This act was met with criticism because of its disproportionate incarceration. Do you know what the war on drugs is? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't quite remember, but I, I remember is that, like, out of nowhere, the prices on drugs went up. Do you think that the war on drugs is actually affecting people who sell? Yeah, well, like, in both negative and positive ways. For example, it could be a positive for us because we sell and make more money, but when we might not be making as much money as we're buying. 
So, you know, we have to we have to sell more, and then we get less because of how much the price went up on drugs now. What type of people buy from you the most? Um, I have to say, um, not be racist or anything, but black people, and I don't know why, but they 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 buy from us the most. At what age did you begin selling drugs, and why? I started selling drugs at age 16 because um my mom I grew up with my mom as a single mother and she ne we never had money so I started helping her and back then it was really influenced the drugs and like you you get caught up in the madness and it like wasn't a big deal back then. Did you ever see yourself selling drugs long term? No, it was just at the moment I I, I didn't really think about it. Why did you stop selling drugs? I stopped selling because like I, I started to notice that like it got it got very risky, you know. It risked my life a, a, a lot of the times, you know, because a lot of stuff happens when you're selling drugs. Um, one time we went to go sell to these these people, and it um we didn't know that they were trying to rob us, and when we got out the car. There was a bunch of people, it just wasn't two people, and they pointed a gun at us, and then they tried to kill us, but um, we had more friends coming, because we always have friends like with us, so then our friends were lucky enough to start shooting at them, but no one was hurt or killed. Have you or another person ever mm -hmm. been in danger because you sell drugs? Um, yes, one time me and my friend, we went to go sell drugs, and... We were going to sell it to these people, right? And we got out the car. They they rushed us. And they, they hit my friend in the head with a gun. And, well, I was all by myself. But we always have friends coming with us. But this time, luckily, like, this time, they were, like, in back of us. They were barely coming. So, I got in the car. I got, I hopped back in the car. And my friend was knocked out in the, in the passenger seat. And while we are backing up, we hit one of their cars. So, we got stuck. <clears throat> And then our friends came and they started shooting at them and then they fled. So then we were lucky lucky we were able to get away. Have you ever had any bad had any bad encounters with the police because you sell? Oh yes. One time, um I had a bunch of drugs on in my car and the the police had stopped me. And it was we were on the highway, we weren't on a freeway. And it was late at night, it was around three in the morning. And it was a new car, and my car didn't have license plate. So when the cop, when the cop stopped me, we pulled over to the side of the road, and when he came to me, um, I drove off, and he hopped back in his car. He started chasing me, and luckily I was familiar with the area, and I turned a couple times, and luckily I lost him. From 1979 to 1989, the percentage of blacks arrested for drug offenses went from 21% to 42%. The total number of African American arrests for drug abuse violations skyrocketed from 112,748 to 452,574, an increase of over 300%. In Baltimore, for instance, black men were 86% of those arrested for drug offenses in 1991. At the end of 1999, over half a million black men and women were held in state and federal prisons. And by 2000, the incarceration rates for black was 3,457 per every 100,000, while the rate was 449 per every 100,000 for whites. In 1995, President Bill Clinton spent $13.2 billion in drug, drug policy and $7.8 billion on supply-side efforts. In 2010, the Fair Sentencing Act was created, reducing crack-to-powder possession arrests from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. In 2012, Colorado and Washington became the first states to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. In 2016, California made it legal to use marijuana for recreational purposes and allows people over 21 to buy up to 8 grams of marijuana. As of 2019, recreational marijuana is now legal in 11 states. Medical marijuana is legal in 33. Listen, you got at least three-fourths of your life to go. That's three more lifetimes to you. So don't blow it. Don't do drugs. If you're doing it, stop it. Get some help.